the topic of this last lecture of the last session of the last day of the 10 day international islamic conference peace the solution for humanity is what is the purpose of our life how many of us have really ever thought in their life what is the purpose of our life how many of us have ever thought what is the purpose of our existence what are we doing here why are we here let us start analyzing right from here itself i request all the people in the audience all of you if you have ever thought in your life what is the purpose of your life please raise your hand i would like to know amongst the audience how many of you have ever thought in your life what is the purpose of your life fine maybe i can see 10 50 maybe 100 hands an audience of more than 100000 that less than 0.1% some may have felt shy to raise their hand. So surely I can say less than 1% of the human beings have ever thought in their life, what is the purpose of our life? Is it required that should we know what is the purpose of our life to help you? Let me give you an example. Once a man, when he was traveling, and when he came at a crossroad, he asked the passerby, where does this road lead to? The passerby asked him, where do you want to go? The man replied, anywhere. The passerby answered, then take any road, it will make no difference. Imagine that traveler, he had no goal. Whatever actions he did, whatever deeds he did, it made no difference because he wanted to go anywhere. And many of us are leading our life in the same way. Let me give you one more example. Imagine there is a builder who starts constructing his building and he lays the foundation and he digs a big hole for the foundation and when you ask him how many stories is your building going to be he says I don't know how many square feet is the built-up area he says I haven't thought of it the builder has got no goal at all once there was a man who told his neighbor your dog always chases vehicles and cars. I wonder, will your dog ever catch up with any car? The neighbor replied, I don't wonder whether he'll catch up or not. I wonder if my dog catches up with the car, what will he do? The man who asked him, will the dog ever catch up with the car? He's short-sighted. The neighbor who was the owner of the dog, he was far-sighted. Even if he caught up with the car, what will he do? What is the purpose of his goal? And unfortunately, many of us, we are leading our lives same fashion, just like the dogs. You know, people do graduation and you ask them, why are you doing graduation? And they don't know the reason. Just because they want to be a graduate, what will you do after you finish your graduation? I haven't thought of it yet. Most of us are leading our lives like that traveler or like the dog who's chasing cars, absolutely without a purpose. Many of us, we 
copy goals of others without scrutinizing it. When we ask a student, why are you doing commerce? So he will reply, because my friend is doing commerce. Many people, they emulate and they copy the actors, the models, without realizing what they're doing. Once a person comes from the village to Bombay to become a millionaire. And when the question was asked to him, why have you come to Bombay? So he gives the reply that I have seen Amita Bachchan in the Hindi movie. He's a pauper, he comes to Bombay and he becomes a multi-millionaire overnight. That is the reason we find many people coming from outside Bombay and they're settling in Bombay to become a multi-millionaire overnight. And that is the reason you find that the sums in Bombay are increasing. Many times we see actors and models, they are brand ambassadors and they endorse certain products. There was a person who purchased a new car, Hyundai i10. And when the question was asked, why have you chosen this particular car, Hyundai i10? So he says, my favorite actor, Shah Rukh Khan, he owns Hyundai i10. I doubt whether Shah Rukh Khan ever sat in Hyundai i10 except in the advertisement. He may be owning a Mercedes or a BMW or somewhat similar. I doubt whether he owns an i10. You know, Shah Rukh Khan endorsed the watch Tagore. He's a brand ambassador of the watch Tagore. And we find many of his fans buying Tagore. I wonder what has Tagore got to do with the acting of Shah Rukh Khan? Has that watch, has that wrist watch ever helped him in acting? I doubt whether he wore Tagore before he became a famous actor also. So these are the various ways the media promotes products. And unfortunately, we blindly follow goals of other people without realizing what we are doing. Imagine there's an industrialist who buys a textile factory. And when asked, why have you bought the textile factory? He tells us that I've come to know that there is good profit in textile business. Then you ask the next question. Do you have a feasibility report? He says, no. Have you hired someone to take care of your business? Have you hired a CEO, chief executive officer? He says, no. What is the percentage of profit you will make? He says, I don't know. Where will you buy the raw materials for? He says, I haven't thought of it. Where will you sell your textile? He says, I don't know. Do you think that businessman will make profit in the textile industry? Imagine there's a person who has a goal. He wants to become the best scientist of the world. What does he do? He does a survey of all the scientists from the first human being, Adam Pease, be upon him till today. And after doing a survey, he comes to know the best scientist of human history was Isaac Newton. And his survey was correct. After that, what does he do? To become like Isaac Newton, he starts growing long hair, curly hair like Isaac Newton. He wears shoes like Isaac Newton. He wears clothes like Isaac Newton. Do you think he will become a successful scientist? Such people have a goal, but the planning is wrong. They have a planning. They did a survey of the scientist, but the planning is wrong.
come to the basic question. What is the purpose of our life? What is the purpose of our existence in this world? Who do you think would be the best person to reply to this question, what is the purpose of our life? Do you think it's Dr. Zakir Naik? Surely the answer is no. Do you think the scientists can answer this question? The answer is no. Do you think the philosopher can answer this question? The answer is no. The best answer to this question, what is the purpose of our life, can be given by our Creator, God Almighty, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And I started my talk by quoting a verse from the Glorious Quran, from Surah Zariyat, chapter number 51. Verse number 56, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَىٰ إِلَّا لِيَعْبْدُونَ I have not created the jinns and the men, but to worship me. I have created the jinn and the men only to worship me. The Arabic word used here is ibadah, coming from the root word abd which means servant, which means slave. Ibada means servitude, means worship. It means obedient submission. In short, Ibada means worship or obeying the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of our Creator Almighty God. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Almighty God commands us, if we obey, it is called as ibadah, it is called as worship. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you have to follow the five pillars. So if you believe in Tawheed, believe there is no God but Allah, then you are doing ibadah, then you are worshipping Allah. If you pray, if you offer salah, you are doing ibadah, you are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you give zakat, obligate to charity, you are doing ibadah, you are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you fast, you are doing ibadah, you are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran that you have to provide neighborly needs. So if you take care of your neighbor, as Quran says in Surah Maun, chapter number 107, verse number 7, then you are doing ibadah, you are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you abstain from the things Almighty God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told you to abstain from, then you're doing ibadah. If you abstain from having alcohol, you're doing ibadah. If you abstain from having pork, you're doing ibadah. You're worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you abstain from stealing, cheating, telling lies, you're doing ibadah. You're worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In short, when you follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you submit your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are doing ibadah, you are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And every act of a human being can be converted into worship if you follow two criteria. Number one is, the act should be done only and only for the pleasure of our Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Point number two, the act should be done according to the sunnah, the way the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has done. If you have these two things in your act, every act of yours can be converted into ibadah, can be converted into worship. Whenever you buy an equipment, along with the equipment, you get an instruction manual. If you allow me to call the human being a machine, you'll have to agree that the human being is the most complicated machine on the face of the earth. Don't you think that this human being, this machine, requires an instruction manual? The last and final instruction manual for the human beings, it is the glorious Quran. 
the glorious Quran, the last and final commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, revealed to the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, is the last and final instruction manual for the human beings. The do's and don'ts, how a human being should lead his life is given in this instruction manual, the glorious Quran. Many people ask me the question, why does Almighty God want us to worship Him? Is He hungry of our worship? Why does He want us to praise Him? Allah Akbar, Allah is the greatest. Is Almighty God hungry for praises? Allah replies in the glorious Quran, in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 15. O ye men, it is you who need Allah, and Allah is free of all wants, worthy of all praises. The Quran says in Surah Fatir, chapter 35, verse number 15, O ye men, it is you who need Allah. Allah is free of all wants and worthy of all praises. The reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to worship Him and to praise Him is not for His benefit. It is for our benefit. When we say Allah Akbar, it does not make Allah great. Allah is already the greatest, irrespective whether you say Allah Akbar or not. Allah will yet remain the greatest. It will make no difference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the reason Allah wants us to praise Him is because He knows the human psychology. We human beings, whenever we praise someone, whenever we know someone who's great and famous, we but natural tend to follow his advice. For example, if your mother has a heart attack and you have an option, there's a layman who comes and gives you advice. Will you follow his advice or a person who you know is the best heart specialist in the world and he's willing to give you free advice? Whose advice will you take? Will you take the advice for your mother from the best heart specialist in the world or from a layman. But naturally, because you know the heart specialist is famous, people keep on praising him, you indirectly tend to follow his advice. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to praise him. He is the greatest. Allah is the greatest. Allah is the most knowing. Allah is the most wise. So that the moment when we say he is the most wise, when he gives us the advice, we indirectly tend to follow it. If we don't agree, he's most wise, most knowledgeable, then the chances we will follow it otherwise is less. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to worship him and to praise him, not so that it will benefit him, but it will benefit us. Allah says in Surah Fatir, Chapter 35, verse number 15. O ye men, it is you who need Allah. Allah is free of all wants, worthy of all praises. Let me give you an example. Suppose there's a couple who's married for several years and they don't have any children. But natural, most of such couples, they will feel sad. You have another couple who's married and they have a child. They bring him up with love and affection. After he reaches the age of 15 or 16, that child dies. But natural, these parents will be sad. The first group of couples who do not have any children, they'll feel sad. But the second group of parents who have children, and after they have brought them up, when they reach the teenage, and when they die, they will feel more sad. Now you have a third category of parents who have children. They bring them up with love and affection. They take care of them. But when they grow and they become an adult, they don't ask about their parents. 
They don't take care of their parents. What would you call such kind of children? Surely, you will call them inhuman, unjust, and ungrateful. All of us will agree that if your parents, they bring you up with love and affection, take care of you, give you all the facilities, once you grow and become an adult, you don't even talk to them, you don't care about them, you don't even meet them. Surely, such children will be called unjust, ungrateful, and inhuman. If you agree with this point, imagine, what would you call those human beings who are ungrateful to the Creator? Our Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, has not only created you, He has even created your parents. So don't you think that we should thank our Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Shouldn't we be obedient to Him? How many of us ever thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the bounties, for the blessings that He has bestowed upon us? How many of us? Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has given us life. He has given us the blessings of this world, food, clothing, shelter. Can you imagine if you don't get water for a few days, but naturally you'll die? How many of us have ever thanked our Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the water He has provided us? Have you ever thought that the air we breathe, if we don't get this air for a few minutes, what will happen to us? But naturally we'll die. How many of us have ever thanked our Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the air He has provided us? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 34, if you count the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will not be able to number it. And man indeed is unjust and ungrateful. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Ayat, chapter number 100, verse number 6, Inna insana li rabbihi laqnood. Verily, human beings are to their Lord very ungrateful. Allah says this in several places, that verily, human beings to their Lord are very ungrateful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to worship Him and to praise Him, not that it will benefit Him, because it will benefit us, benefit the human beings. Imagine, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to know that after you have followed his advice, it's benefiting his creation, he feels happy. For example, if there's a doctor who's giving free treatment and free advice to the poor patients, imagine if that patient doesn't listen to the advice of the doctor, how does the doctor feel? And if you follow the advice of the doctor, it will not benefit the doctor. He's giving you free treatment. It will benefit you. And once you follow his advice, the doctor is happy. At least my patient has now become healthy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is far superior than all the doctors in the world. It's mentioned who is Shafi. It is he who cures. So when you worship him, when you follow his advice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is happy because the moment you praise Him and you follow His advice, it benefits His creation. It benefits the human beings and it pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is not pleased when you worship Him and praise Him because it benefits Him. He's pleased because it benefits 
the human beings, his creations. And even after you commit sins, you commit crimes, the moment you repent, the moment you ask for forgiveness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately forgives you. Allah mentions this in several places in the Quran. Wallahu ghafuru rahim. And Allah is of forgiving and most merciful. In several places, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 25. In Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 74. In Surah Al Hijr, chapter number 15, verse number 49. In Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 119. In Surah Al Zamur, chapter number 39, verse 53. In Surah Buruj, chapter number 85, verse number 14. Wallahu ghafurur rahim. For verily, Allah is of forgiving and most merciful. Even though you don't obey Him, even though you disobey Him, you don't follow His advice, the moment you repent, the moment you ask for forgiveness, Allah forgives you and He's happy. He's pleased that you made a mistake. These human beings are my creation. I forgive them. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 48, and in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 116, if Allah pleases, He will forgive any sin. But the sin of shirk, associating partners with God, joining partners with God, Allah will never forgive. For anyone who has done shirk, associated partners with God, he has done a heinous sin. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive any sin if he pleases. But the sin of shirk, if you die as a mushrik, if you die associating partners with God, and before your death, if you do not repent, if you do not ask for forgiveness, Allah will never forgive you. So one greatest sin from which all humankind should abstain from. Number one is shirk. Associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Joining God with Almighty God. People very often ask this question. We understand God has created the human beings for worshipping Him. But what is so special about the human beings? Why has He created us? Human beings are a unique creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are the best creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The human beings and the jinns are the only creation who have a free will of their own. All the other creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they have submitted their will to Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they do not have any free will. They obey Allah 100%. They have no choice. But the human beings and the jinns, they have option to either obey or to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah 10, chapter number 95, verse number 4, Verily, we have created the human beings in the best of molds. For verily, we have created the human beings in the best of molds. Human being is the best creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Besides being created in the best of molds, we are unique. We have a choice of either obeying or disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After a free will has been given to you, and if you obey the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are superior to the angels. Because the angels, they have no free will. They obey Almighty God without a free will. So if after a free will has been given to you, and if you obey and submit your will to Almighty God, you are superior to the angels. You know, when we say, Oh, this man is an angel. It has two meanings. One is, maybe it's an insult because human beings are superior to angels. But it means 
that you are a human being after free will is given to you but you are obeying the laws of god like an angel so it makes you superior a human being who is obeying like the angel so then it makes you superior but if you disobey allah subhanahu wa taala if you go against his commandments then you become the brother of the devil and you become a satan so human beings have a choice to either obey the commandments of allah subhanahu wa taala and to become superior than the angels or to disobey him and become like the satan the choice is yours and when we analyze that why has allah subhanahu wa taala why has he created us it is because we are the best of creations we have an option of either obeying him or we have the option of disobeying him if you obey him we become superior than the angels if you disobey him we become like the satan and this life allah says is a test for us i started my talk by also quoting one more verse of the quran of surah mulk chapter number 67 verse number 2 allah says allazi khalaqal mauta wal hayata li yabluwakum ayyukum ahsanu amala allah has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds allah has created death and life to test which of the human beings are good in deeds so this life is a test for the hereafter Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al Imran chapter number 3 verse number 85 Kullu nafsin zaikatul maut every soul shall have a taste of death Your final recompense will be on the day of judgment and whosoever has been saved from the fire and has entered the garden of paradise he has achieved the objectives of this world For verily this life is goods of chattels and deception allah says in the quran in surah baqara chapter number 2 verse number 155 be sure we shall test you with something of fear or hunger or loss in goods or lives or the fruits of your toils and give glad tidings to those who patiently persevere allah subhanahu wa taala has created this life for us and that as a test to test which of the human beings is good indeed and surely allah will test you with fear with hunger with loss of goods with loss of life and what you have earned in your full life the fruits of your toils he will test different people in different ways verse number 71 that allah subhanahu wa taala bestows his sustenance more freely on some of the human beings as compared to others allah says in the quran in surah anam chapter number 6 verse number 165 that he has raised some of the human beings in higher ranks above others and he has bestowed gifts on some of them so that he will test them so if allah raises you in ranks and gives gift to you bestows bounties on you be prepared allah is testing you allah says in the quran in surah anfal chapter number 8 verse number 28 that your wealth and your children they are a test for you the wealth that almighty god has given you the children that almighty god has given you they are a test for you allah says in surah munafiqun chapter number 63 verse number 9 let not the love of your wealth and children take you away from the remembrance of allah subhanahu wa taala allah says in the quran in surah ankabut chapter number 29 verse number 2 do not think just by saying you believe allah will let you go and allah will not test you so just by saying i am a muslim 
I am a believer. I am a mu'min. Allah says in the Quran, don't think that Allah will not test you. Allah will surely test you. And only if you pass in the test, will you get paradise. Just by saying I am a Muslim, I am Muhammad, I am Zakir, I am Abdullah, will not take you to Jannah. Allah will surely test you. And if you pass in the test, then inshallah I'll go to Jannah. What are the criteria for a person to go to paradise, for a person to attain Jannah? And the answer to this question is given in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, where Allah says, Wal Asr, inna al insana la fi khusr, illa lazin amanu, wa amilu salihati, wa tawasaw bil haqq, wa tawasaw bil sabr. By the token of time, Man is verily in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who do righteous deeds, those who exhort people to truth, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. For a person to attain P3, he has to do P4. P3 is, first P is the pleasure of Allah, to attain the pleasure of Allah, peace in this world and paradise in the hereafter, to attain these three P, you have to do four P's. The first P is the purity of faith. Second P is piety, righteous deeds. Third P is propagation, inviting people to truth. And the fourth P is patience and perseverance. Invite people to patience and perseverance. For any human being to attain the pleasure of Allah and peace in this world and paradise in the hereafter, he should have Iman, that is purity of faith. He should have Amal Salihat, righteous deeds, piety. He should have Watawa Sawbil Haq. He should do Watawa Sawbil Haq, invite people to the truth, that is do propagation. And Watawa Sawbil Sabr, invite people to patience and perseverance. To attain three Ps, you should follow the four Ps. And the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad It's mentioned in Sunnah Tirmidhi, volume number four, chapter number 60, hadith number 2517. Anas ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with him. He said that once a man, he asked the Prophet, should I tie it that is my camel and trust in Allah or should I leave it? Leave my camel and then trust in Allah. The Prophet said, tie it. Tie your camel and then trust in Allah. That does not mean that you leave your camel and then say that I have got trust in Allah. Tawakullah. I have got trust in Allah. You can't leave your door open and then say, you know, I have got trust in Allah. No robber will come. You have to close your door and then trust in Allah. Trust in Allah is important, but also following the guidance of Allah is important. And for success, trust in Allah is the most important. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 160. If Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who is there then who can help you? So let the believers Put the trust in Allah. Allah says in Surah An-Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 69, that if you strive in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will open up your pathways. Allah also says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 43, and Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 7, Fas'alu ahali zikri in kuntum la ta'lamun. If you don't know, ask the person who is knowledgeable. Ask the one who possesses the message. So for success, first is trust in Allah. Number two is striving, doing jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three is ask the person who knows. Even planning is important. Even goal setting is important. And we find when we read the books of management gurus, there are various goal settings that have been given by them. But for me, the best planning the best goal setting is Islamic. I-S-L-A-M-I-C. 
A M I C. I is for Islamic. Your goal should be according to the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Your goal should be based on the teachings of Quran and the teachings of Sahih Hadith of the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. It should be Islamic, number one. S, your goal should be specific. It should be focused. Your goal can't be vague. Let me give you an example. Once there was a teacher who was teaching archery to his students. And he tells his students, who were learning bow and arrow, aim at that bird who is sitting on the treetop. All of them take aim. He said, don't release until I give you command. So he asked the first student, have you taken aim? He said, yes. What do you see? He says, I see the forest, I see the trees, and I also see the bird. He asked the second student, what do you see? He said, sir, I see the tree, I see the branch of the tree, and I see the bird. He asked the third student, what do you see? The third student replies, I only see the branch of the tree, and the bird, and the eye of the bird. He asked the fourth student, what do you see? The fourth student replies, sir, I only see the eye of the bird and nothing else. The teacher says, let the arrow go. And the arrow hits the eye of the bird. Your goal should be specific. It should be focused. It should not be like the traveler who wants to go nowhere. Not like the dog who's running after a car without purpose. Number three, L. L is for lucrative. It should be profitable. Number one, it should be profitable in the year after, Akhira. And if possible, simultaneously, it can even be profitable in this world. But more important is Akhira. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 201. Oh Lord, give us the good in this world and the hereafter and save us from the torment of hellfire. So it should be lucrative, it should be profitable, number one in the hereafter and then secondly in this world. But more important is the hereafter and then the world. Let not your profit of this world take you away from the profit of the hereafter. Fourth is A. A, it should be apt. It should be appropriate. It should be suitable. Your goal should be apt and appropriate. M. M is for measurable. Your goal should be measurable. And for your goal to be measurable, first it should be specific. After it is specific, it should also be measurable. For example, suppose the builder says, I want to build the tallest building in the world, the goal is specific. But to make it measurable, he does a survey. Which is the tallest building in the world? And he comes to know that Buruj al Khalifa, it is 828 meters tall, specific. So now his goal is, he has to build a building which is more than 828 meters tall. It's specific and measurable. If it's measurable, it can be monitored. How much are you reaching? How much are you coming closer to your goal? I is for intention. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, chapter number one, book of faith, hadith number one. First hadith of Bukhari, innamal amalu binniya. Your deeds will be judged on your intentions. And you'll be rewarded for your intentions. Your intention should be to please Allah and His Rasul, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Your intention should not be to become famous, to become popular. If that's your intention, then your goal is not correct. If your intention is to please Allah, your Creator, and His Messenger, 
surely you will be rewarded in the hereafter and inshallah allah will reward you even in this world it should be consistent till the time you achieve the goal if the goal is time bound if it is not time bound it should be consistent forever for example if your goal is i want to read quran at least once in the month of ramadan so then you have a target i will read one juz every day then you are consistent every day in the month of ramadan you read one juz of the quran at the end of ramadan you will finish the quran at least once if your goal is not time bound maybe you want to say i want to read the quran daily then you set up a target i will read quran every day half juz or maybe one juz and then you start the moment you achieve reading half juz or one juz a day keep on being consistent till the end of your life and our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it's mentioned in sahih muslim volume number 1 book of salah chapter number 272 hadith number 1711 he said that once a person asked the prophet which is the best of deeds which is loved by allah so the prophet said allah loves those deeds which are done consistently even if they are small it is far better than bigger deeds which are done only once so deeds which are done consistently are far superior than deeds which are done once in a while even if they are greater so the goal should be islamic i for islamic s for specific focused l for lucrative profitable a for apt appropriate m for measurable which can be monitored i for intention should be to please allah and c it should be consistent let me give an example some of us may be aware of the history of wilma rudolf wilma rudolf was a girl who was born and she had polio since childhood and the doctors they put braces on her legs and they said this girl will never set foot on the earth her mother she encouraged the child and she told wilma what you want to do you will be able to do and the mother encouraged her daughter wilma at the age of 9 she removed the braces and she wanted to be the fastest woman on the earth that was a desire that was a goal after removing the braces at the age of 9 at the age of 13 for the first time in her life she takes part in a race and she loses she comes out last but yet she is consistent she keeps on striving she loses again she strives a day comes when she qualifies for the olympics and this is a true story it's not an anecdote it's not a fairy tale once she qualifies for the olympics in 1960 olympics she comes out first in 100 meters amongst the women she gets the gold medal she also gets the gold medal in 200 meter sprint amongst the women she also wins the gold medal for the 400 meter relay 100 into 4 amongst the women she gets three gold medals in the 1960 olympics and she creates history a paralyzed a paralytic woman who had polio she becomes the fastest women on the face of the earth in the year 1960 now when we analyze the goal setting done by wilma and if you have read books of the management gurus she fulfills all the criteria those who have read about the smart goals i don't want to go into detail but let us verify how much she fulfills of the main target of the creator islamic number 
Was the goal Islamic? Was the goal according to Quran and Sunnah? I don't know her personal life, but I knew that she was not a Muslim. I don't know whether she did it for the Creator or not. Number two, was the goal specific? Yes, it was specific. She wanted to be the fastest woman on the face of the earth. Was it lucrative? Was it profitable? Yes. For this world, it was profitable. She gets fame, she gets honor, but for the hereafter, Allah alam. I doubt whether in the hereafter, this Olympic gold medal will bring a profit. Unless she dedicates the gold medal towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A, was it apt and appropriate? Yes, it was. M, was it measurable? Yes, she could measure who is the fastest woman on the face of the earth. Maybe the timing is somewhere close to 9 seconds or 10 seconds or 11 seconds. Measurable. And she practiced, she achieved a goal. I, what was the intention? If intention was fame, surely she got it. Was the intention to please Allah? I doubt. C. Was it consistent? Yes. It was consistent. She consistently practiced even though she lost till she won and became the fastest woman on the earth. Let me give you another example to compare and show the difference between goal setting. I would like to give an example of the man of the person who had very small means but reached the heights in his field. The man, the person who changed my life and converted me from a doctor of a body to a doctor of soul. And I'm sure you know the name of that man. He's none other than Sheikh Ahmad Tidad. Let us compare his goal setting. Sheikh Ahmad Didad. And if you know the life history of Sheikh Ahmad Didad, he acquired education only till standard six. Because both his ends could not meet, he was forced to leave his education. After passing standard six, he was forced to leave his education. A man with small means. He was forced to leave the country India where he was born. Then he goes to South Africa. He does a job of a salesman. He works in a furniture shop. He does the job of driving, etc. And while he was in South Africa, he used to constantly be harassed by the Christian missionaries who used to tell Islam is a useless religion. It is merciless. They used to attack Islam. And because he used to get harassed, a desire came in his heart that I want to reply all the allegations against Islam made by these Christian missionaries. I want to give a fitting reply to these Christian missionaries. Imagine a man only studied to standard six. But naturally he had faith in Allah. He strived. He stumbled across a book books which were lying in a room which had dust on it. He stumbles across a book by the name of Izar al-Haq, the truth revealed by Maulana Rahmatullah Karanvi. And he gets the direction for his goal. That's how he started. And he strived for 40 years till the time he challenged the stalwarts of Christianity. Imagine a sixth standard pass man strive for 40 years and challenge the stalwarts of the world. So much so that in 1986, he was about to debate Reverend Jimmy Swaggart. And at that time, in 1980s, Jimmy Swaggart was the number one most powerful, most famous Christian televangelist. Just a few weeks before his debate, one of the fans of Sheikh Dida told him 
that Sheikh Ahmed Didat, I'm your fan, but I want to give you an advice. This man, Jimmy Swaggart, I know him. I've studied him. Please don't debate him. He will chew you and he will spit you out. Imagine a fan of Didat giving advice to Didat. You don't debate this Jimmy Swaggart. You don't know him, I know him. He will chew you and he will spit you out. The person who was the most famous televangelist who owned television channels, whose budget was more than a million dollars a day to keep his head above water. Our Sheikh Ahmed Didat, mashallah. With Allah on his side, he goes to USA in the hometown of that Christian missionary. In the country, very famous. He goes and he has a debate. And Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah, with Allah's help, he turns the tables over. Imagine a man of small means, not even past school, leave aside being a graduate, challenges the stalwarts of Christianity, so much so that he became the biggest stumbling block for the Christianity of the world, for the Christian missionaries. One man alone, Sheikh Ahmad Didat, with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he challenged the whole of Christianity. <laughs> Let's analyze this goal setting. Number one, the Islamic. I, was it Islamic? Was it according to Quran and Sahih Hadith? Was it for Allah and His Rasul? But naturally it was. That's the reason he was able to achieve his goal. Number two, was it specific? Yes. His goal was specific. I want to reply to the allegations against Islam. Specific. I want to give a fitting reply. Remove the misconceptions about Islam that is there in the minds of the non-Muslim. Number three, was it lucrative? Was it profitable? He wanted profit in Akhra. And inshallah, inshallah, Allah will grant him Jannah, inshallah. But besides being profitable in the Akhra, it even profited him here. You know, a number six standard past man in 1986, he gets the biggest award in the Muslim world. He is awarded the King Faisal Award for service in humanity. A six standard man. He didn't do for the award. Maybe he got $200,000, he didn't do it for that. Maybe for the gold, King Faisal Award, he didn't do it for that. He did for Allah and his Rasul. Allah profits him in Akhirah and even in this world. Lucrative. A. Was it apt? Was it appropriate? Very apt. At the right time. His style, everything at that time. When the Christian missionaries were hammering the Muslims. Our morale was at the lowest. This man, Sheikh Ahmed Didad, he inspired thousands of youngsters, including myself. We could at least raise our head and stand. Apt. M. Was it measurable? Yes. What did he do? He collected the books of Christianity, the Christian missionaries who wrote against Islam. You know, John Gilchrist, all these books, Jimmy Swaggart, and started replying. When they attacked the Quran and Islam, he replied, and he studied their scripture, Bible, used the verse of the Quran, and implemented on them, and he found results. Measurable. I. What was his intention? His intention wasn't to become famous. His intention wasn't to win the King Faisal Award. His intention was to please Allah and His Rasul. C. Was he consistent? Yes, he was. Imagine, he struggled and strived for 40 years. And if you know his history, his office was a small, dungy place. And he tells us that even to print a black and white pamphlet, a thousand quantity, they used to have a meeting. Let's have a meeting. Can we print thousand quantity of a black and white pamphlet? MashaAllah. Consistent, kept on striving till he reached his goal. 
The difference that we find in Wilma Rudolph and Sheikh Ahmed Didat is that the goal of Wilma Rudolph, it was short-sighted. It was more for this world. But the goal of Sheikh Ahmed Didad, it was far-sighted. And it was for the Akhirah. And inshallah, Allah will give him reward in the Akhirah and even give him reward in this world. Most of us human beings, what is our purpose of life? Number one purpose of our life is how to earn a living. Majority of the people you ask them and you inquire with them, number one, the main concern is to earn a living. They are more bothered about earning a living than how to lead a life. And depending upon how much they earn, their lifestyle revolves around it. What will they eat? What will they wear? Where will they live? Which school will they study in? Which graduation course they'll take up? Everything revolves around their earnings. And these people think that if I can earn good money in this world, they have achieved the purpose of their life. You know, I gave the example of being focused. You know, most of us, what we do, instead of focusing on the eye of the bird and shooting, what do we do? We shoot and then we draw the bullseye around it. We shoot anywhere. We take up any course of graduation. Then when we ask, why have you taken this course? Oh, I haven't thought of it. Then they do speciality. Then they do super speciality. And then they try and justify why they have chosen that course. You know, people, first they think how much will they earn. And based on what will they earn, they decide how will they lead their life. This is just an apt example of shooting in the air and then drawing the bullseye. First, we have to identify what is our center. On which act does our life revolve around? Different people have different centers of their life. Some people, they are self-centered. Everything for them is themselves. They are least bothered about anyone else in the world. They are only bothered about themselves. How they lead their life, they are least bothered about others. They are self-centered. Some people, they are family-centered. Their whole life revolves around that their family is happy. They are ready to break and make any rule, irrespective whether it's right or wrong, to make their family members happy. The main aim in life is to make their family members happy. Some may be parent-centered. Some may be spouse-centered, wife-centered, husband-centered. Some may be children-centered. No, some people, to make their parents happy, they will go to any extent. The whole rules and regulations of life are based on what their parents like and don't like. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 14, that we have enjoined on the human beings to be good to their parents. In travail upon travail did the mother bore them, and in pain did she give them birth. Immediate next verse, Surah Luqman chapter 31 verse number 15 says, but if your parents strive, do jihad, strive and struggle to make you worship somebody else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of which you have no knowledge, don't obey them. Yet, live with them with love and compassion. That means, our creator says, you have to love your parents, you have to respect them, obey them, but if they tell you to go against the Creator, against Allah and His final messenger, you don't have to obey them yet. Live with them with love and compassion. There are limits. Some of us, we are spouse-centered. We want to satisfy our wives or we want to satisfy our husbands. And suppose the man's wife, she wants a very expensive diamond necklace. The person, he can't afford it. What does he do? He begs, borrows and steals, but buys that expensive diamond necklace for his wife. 
His goal is to satisfy his wife. Some of us, we are children-centered. We want to satisfy our children. And there are cases where sometimes the son wants to go abroad for studies. The course in which he is getting admission is useless. It will not help him in the Akhira, won't help him here also. But yet, because the son wants to go abroad, this person mortgages his property and sends his son to America and then says, Mera beta to America me raha hai. As though the objective of his life is to send his son to America to study. What are the objectives? What is the center of your life? Some of us, we are society-centered. We want to know what do the other people outside our family think about us. So full life revolves around the society. Some people, they are neighbor-centered. They are having competition with the neighbor. That reminds me of an anecdote. Once an angel, he comes and tells a man, I am pleased with you. Whatever you ask, I will fulfill your desire. But there is one condition. Whatever you ask, I will give it to you, but I will give your neighbor double. So the man says, I want a Rolex watch. So the angel gives him a Rolex watch. But gives the neighbor two Rolex watches. The man says, I want a Mercedes car. The angel gives him a Mercedes car, but gives the neighbor two Mercedes cars. The man says, I want a big beautiful bungalow. The angel gives him a big beautiful bungalow, but next to his bungalow, there are two big beautiful bungalows given to his neighbor. So the man says, angel, please fulfill my last one desire. What is it? Please break my one eye so that I cannot see with one eye. Imagine, he is more bothered about his neighbor than himself. He is not bothered whether his life is simple or complicated, whether he lives in poverty or luxury. He is more bothered that he should lead a better life than his neighbor. So much so that he tells the angel, break my one eye, so that my neighbors, both eyes are broken. This is how we are neighbor-centered. He's not bothered whether he's happy or he can see or not see. As long as the neighbor is completely blind, I don't mind losing one eye. Neighbor-centered. Some people are friend-centered. Some people are enemy-centered. They are more bothered what are the enemies doing. What is my enemy thinking against me? So they plan strategies. If my enemy does this, I will do that. Full time, the full life goes in thinking what their enemy is doing. And you find this in various, you have businessmen thinking about the enemy, you have politicians thinking about the enemy, you have students thinking about the enemies. What are they planning? So I will counter plan. They spend most of the time in planning to counter the enemy. I would like to give a piece of beautiful advice to them, which I follow in my life. If someone throws stones at you, raise yourself so high so that the stones don't reach you. If someone throws stones at you, raise yourself so high the stones should not reach you. So where is the question of competition? Where is the question of the enemy planning against you? And there's another advice. If someone throws bricks at you, Use those bricks to build your house. When I was in school, I used to learn martial arts. Karate, judo. And if a big man comes and pushes you, what do you do? You take a side step, use this force to throw him over. Use this force. If someone throws bricks at you, use that brick to build your house. Some people are fame-centered. They want to get famous. 
The main aim is to get famous. They can break any of the principles. They can break any of the rules and regulations. Some people, they are materialistic. They are material-centered. They are more bothered what do they own, what do they possess, what do they wear. And this is common, very common amongst people who are rich. And when they meet their friends, they start discussing, what brand of watch are you wearing? Is it Tiger? Is it Omega? Oh, it is Rolex. What is the strap? Is it metal strap or leather strap? What is the basil? Oh, what kind of a dial do you have? Is it gold plated or is it diamond studded? Oh, designer watch. Parthi Philip. And most of these people who are rich, they don't have one watch. They have multiple watches. Then they start planning. Okay, this watch I wore today. Next time I'll not wear the same watch when I meet my friend. So they've spent their time in planning which watch to wear for which function. These same people then start discussing about cars. What car do you have? BMW? Mercedes? Porsche? Rolls Royce? Maybach? Bentley? Designer? This is the pastime. And very often, as though this is the identity. If they don't wear that watch, who will recognize them? If they don't travel in the car, if they don't travel in Mercedes or BMW, who will recognize them? This is the identity. This is common amongst people of big cities. On a higher level you go, they start discussing what yacht do you have? What kind of ship do you own? On a higher level, which jet do you own? I have a private jet. How many engines? People may be wondering, how come I know all the nitty-gritty of the watches, of the brands? You know the profession that I am in? Alhamdulillah. Fortunately or unfortunately, the profession that I am in, I mix around with all types of people, right from paupers to the kings. Allah has blessed me. Fortunately or unfortunately, I mix around with people who are paupers to the kings. And every opportunity I get, whenever I meet a person, who's materialistic, I try and convey the message. And I tell them, you know your watch may be costing thousands of dollars, or tens of thousands of dollars, or hundreds of thousands of dollars. My watch that I'm wearing, it cost only 1400 rupees, less than 30 dollars. I have it for several years, yet it gives the same time accuracy as your watch. Simple watch, 1400 rupees. Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed me. All these brands that I mentioned, most of these brands have got gifts. I've got gifts of these brands. All these, Omega, Rolex, many I got. And I always follow the guidance of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I give it to other dais and I give it to my staff members so that I'm away from the khutwa to shaitan. There have been occasions there have been occasions when my hosts, they sent their private jet plane, their private jet plane to get me into the country. There were few occasions. Imagine the cost of the fuel of the private jet plane just to get one man. The salary of the pilot, the salary of the air hostess, the salary of hiring the airport. So I told this man that it would have been preferable that you have given me an economic class. Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed. Allah has blessed my family. That mashallah, we can own all these cars. We can travel first class, alhamdulillah. But I'm a dai. So I told him, instead of spending such a big amount, you would preferably give me an economic class air ticket. I would have come and you could have given the difference in charity in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My host also, mashallah, being very clever, he told me that who can I send my jet private plane to pick up? Who is a better person than a dai of Allah? So I told him, inshallah, if a niyat was there, inshallah, I'll get the reward. His niyat was, 
to give a servant of Allah the best of treatment, Allah will reward him. The point to be noted is, I am not telling you that all these material things are haram. They are not always haram. You have to know your objectives of life. They can become haram. They may not become haram. Let me give an example. Suppose you belong to category one, in which a person cannot afford these things. These expensive watches, expensive cars, expensive bungalows. Yet, he begs, borrows and steals. Or he takes a loan and he wears his expensive watches. He drives in expensive cars. It is called as israf. It is haram. We have second category of people who Allah has given them the means. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 71, we have bestowed bounties more freely on some human beings than the others. But Allah says in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse number 165, that Allah has raised some people in higher ranks and giving gifts to others so that He may test you. So if Allah has given you the means and if you have all these things, expensive cars, expensive watches, expensive bungalows and if your life is revolving around it then you cannot do without it it is your center, it is your purpose of life yet it is haram we have the third category of people who Allah has given the means they own these things but they aren't dependent on them they own it we have examples of Prophet who was rich and he owned but you wasn't dependent on it. So if you own these things and yet you follow the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you aren't dependent on these material things, then it is mubah. It's optional. It is not haram. But the best category is the fourth category. That Allah has given you the means and yet you don't use it. You don't acquire it. Like a beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the power he had, the fame he had, the command he had, he could have become the king of the world that time. He could have owned all the riches. But whenever he got a gift, most often, almost all the times, he gave the gifts to the Sahabas. Not that it was haram to own it. If someone gives a good gift, you can keep it. It's not haram. But the Prophet, he gave it to others. The fourth category, Allah has given you the means. But yet, you spend those means in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to identify our center. What is our center? The most important center for the human being is he should be Allah centered. His purpose, his goal should be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the last and final message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And believe me, if you are Allah centered, that does not mean that you neglect yourself, you neglect your family, that you neglect your society. If you are Allah centered, Allah says that take care of yourself, sleep at night. Allah says, that take care of your family. Allah says about your parents in Surah Isra chapter number 17, verse number 23 and 24, that Allah has ordained that you worship none but Him, that you be kind to your parents. And if one of them or both of them reach old age, don't say a word of contempt. Don't say off to them. But address them with honor. And lower to them your wing of humility. And pray to the Lord that cherish them as they cherish me in childhood. That means if you are Allah centered, you have to love your parents. You have to respect them. You have to obey them. Only when they go against Allah and His Rasul, that's the time you don't obey, but live with them with love and compassion. Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 14 and 15. If you are Allah centered, that does not mean they don't take care of your wife. It is the hadith of a beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Hadith number 7396. A beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the best of the believers are those who are best to the family, especially your wife. 
Allah center doesn't mean neglecting your family, neglecting your society. Allah says in Surah Mount chapter 107, verse 1 to 7, that you provide neighborly needs. Help your neighbors. A beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's hadith in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, book of faith, hadith number 13, that a person is not a believer if he does not wish for his brother the same thing what he likes for himself. That means take care of your other people. So by being Allah-centered, it doesn't mean that you're neglecting, that you have to lead a life of a pauper. Your focus should be Allah. If Allah has given you wealth, see to it that use your wealth for the cause of Allah. If Allah has given you fame, use that fame for the way of Allah. If Allah has given you qualities, if Allah has bestowed gifts on you, use it for the cause of Allah. And the best example, the role model for the person who was the most Allah-centered is the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the best example of a person who is Allah-centered and a mercy only for the Muslims. He was the mercy for the whole of humankind. And Allah says in Surah Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee not but as a mercy to the whole of humanity, as a mercy to all the creatures, as a mercy to all the worlds. The best example for a person who had the best purpose of life, the best example in humankind, for a person who converted the barbarians into human beings, for a person who changed the humankind. And when we read his history, you can speak for hours and days together. Leave aside what the Muslims have said about the beloved Prophet Muhammad We can give hundreds of quotations of non-Muslims who have praised the Prophet. Just to give you a few examples, George Bernard Shaw, he said, when talking about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, I have studied him, that is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in my opinion, far from being an antichrist, he should be called as a savior for humanity. George Bernard Shaw. <laughs> Thomas Carlyle, he was a famous historian. He was a European, a non-Muslim. He writes a book, Heroes and Hero Worship. And he gives down the history of hero. And number one hero, a hero prophet. It wasn't Jesus, peace be upon him. It wasn't Moses, peace be upon him. It was not David, peace be upon him. It was not Solomon, peace be upon him. It was Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Imagine Thomas Carlyle, a European, for the Christian, he places number one hero prophet as Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We have the example of Lamartine. Lamartine was a famous historian, he was a French, who wrote the history of the Turks. And he writes, if greatness of purpose, smallness of means, and astounding results. If these three are the criteria to judge the greatness of a person, there will be no one in modern history who would dare to compare himself with Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. If greatness of purpose, smallness of means, and astounding results are the three criteria for judging how great a person is, I dare any man in human history, modern history, who will come close to Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he continues, with all standards of humankind, there is no one who can compare himself to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Michael H. Hart, he's a famous historian, and he writes a book 
on the hundred most influential people in your ministry, right from Adam peace be upon him till present time. And number one he places is Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. The most influential person in history from Adam till present time, peace be upon him, is Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. And he writes, my choice of putting Muhammad peace be upon him number one will surely astonish many people. Would not go down the throat, would not be agreeable by many people. But the reason I've chosen Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him as number one because he was the only man in history who was successful in the religious field as well as secular field. <laughs> and if you read Encyclopedia Britannica, 11th edition, when talking about Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, he says that Muhammad peace be upon him was the most successful religious personality of the world. Imagine Encyclopedia Britannica. They are forced, they have no choice. If they want to be authentic, how much ever they try, they have to mention the truth. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, وَقُلْ جَعَلْ حَقْ وَزَاقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ قَانَ زَوْكَ When truth is held against falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Qalam, chapter number 68, verse number 4, Verily, in Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, you have the most sublime and excellent character. Allah says in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 21, Indeed, in the messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, you have a beautiful pattern of conduct. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was successful in all the fears of life. Not only religious, he was successful in political, in secular, in how to lead a life. He was so successful that every act of his could be emulated. What he wears, if you emulate, inshallah you get sawab. He commanded, he wore trousers above the ankle. If you wear trousers above the ankle, inshallah you'll get a reward. Unlike if you want to become a scientist, long hair will not help you, like Isaac Newton, shoes will not help you, clothes will not help you. But if you want to become like the Prophet, everything the Prophet did, if you copy, it will benefit you. In this world, as well as Akhira. He told you to sport a beard. If you sport a beard, inshallah it will benefit you. Whatever the Prophet did, he was successful in all spheres of life. He is the best role model anyone can follow. In the history of Islam, you have several role models. Where is the example of Al Ashra Mubashara? The 10 people who were promised paradise by the Prophet. Mentioned Sunnah Tirmidhi, volume number 4, hadith number 1171 where the beloved prophet promised 10 people paradise. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Umar bin al-Khattab, Usman bin Affan, Ali bin Abi Talib, Tala bin Ubaidullah, Zubair bin Awam, Abdurrahman bin Auf, Saad bin Abi Waqas, Said bin Zaid, Abu Ubaidu, Ibn al-Jarrah. These 10 people, they were promised paradise by the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They are the role models if you read the life history. Time does not permit to speak in detail. We have the example of women who are role models. The best example is Mother Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 42, and behold, the angel said, O Mary, inna Allah has tafaki, wa taharaki, wa tafaki, Allah nisal alameen, Allah has chosen thee, and purified thee, and chosen thee, above the women of all nations. Marim alayhi salam, she was chosen as the woman, above the women of all nations. We have the example of Asya, may Allah be pleased with her, who was the wife of Aaron. Allah says in Surah Tahreem, chapter number 66, verse number 11, that she prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that 
I pray that I would like to exchange for a mansion in Jannah close to Allah in exchange for everything of the Pharaoh and his deeds. That means she prays that she wants a place in Jannah close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in exchange of all the wealth she has. She was the wife of the richest man in the world that time, the most powerful man in the world that time, Pharaoh. We have the example of Khatija Mella be Pizita, who was the first wife of Prophet Muhammad. We have the example of Fatima Mella be Pizita, who was the daughter of Muhammad. These were role models for the women. We have examples of best couple, best husband and wife, that's Prophet Muhammad and Bibi Khatija. May Allah be pleased with her. We have the example of worst couple, worst husband, worst wife. Abu Lahab and his wife. Allah says in Surah Al Lahab, chapter number 111, that both of them they will burn in hell. We have the example of best husband and worst wife. Allah says in Surah Tahrim, chapter number 60, verse number 10, that we have the examples in the wives of Lut salam and Noah salam that they were righteous servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but their wives, they did not follow the husband and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the wives in hellfire we have the example of best wife and the worst husband which I gave earlier Asya may Allah be pleased with her who was the wife of Firon Firon was the worst husband she was the best wife and the prayer she gave in Surah Tahrim chapter number 66 verse number 11 I would like to have a place in Jannah close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in exchange of the wealth of the world all the wealth of Firon we have several examples. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that Allah loves a strong believer more than a weak believer. In our present age, we have several examples. We have an example of Sheikh bin Baz. May Allah have mercy on him. Rahimullah. He had small means. He was blind. Yet, he was a scholar. Even though he was blind, he was one of the best scholars of his time. I give you the example of Sheikh Ahmad Didad. Six standard pass, challenged the stalwarts of Christianity. You have another example. Though not great, but unique. That's in myself. My example itself. Though I don't consider myself great, but it's unique. Those who know my childhood, they know that I was a stammerer. If you would have asked me, what is my name? I would have said, my name is Zah, 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 Zakir. That was me. I was a stammerer since childhood. Being inspired by Sheikh Ahmad Didad. While I was doing my medical studies, I could have dreamt of becoming the best doctor in the world. But I could not have dreamt of even speaking to 25 people. That was me, Zakir Nai. I could have dreamt of becoming the best doctor in the world, best surgeon, but I could not have dreamt in my wildest dream. You know, in your dream you can dream anything, but I could not have dreamt of speaking in front of 25 people. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with his help, being inspired by Sheikh Ahmad Didad. Now this servant of Allah, humble, mashallah, speaks in audiences of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, mashallah. You can see the audience there, more than 100,000. <laughs> My main aim, being inspired by Sheikh Ahmad Didad, when we started our foundation, Islam Research Foundation, it was not to become a speaker, it was to make a place to make speakers. You can't be a king, become a kingmaker. I could not become a speaker. So I started an organization to make speakers. Allah has this planning. The first speaker got cold feet. I was forced to go on the stage. And I realized that while I'm doing dawah with the non-Muslims, I don't stammer. When I speak with the Muslims, I stammer. When I speak with the non-Muslims, I don't stammer. When I'm on the stage, normally people stammer on the stage. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When I went on the stage, I didn't stammer. He has his way. He made me from a doctor of a body to a doctor of a soul. And Sheikh Ahmed Didad, you know, asked him, Uncle, in 1987 I met him the first time. You know, I was his driver, chauffeur. Wherever he used to go, I used to take him because I could spend more time with him. And Uncle, why are you so aggressive? He told me, Son, 
I'm not aggressive, I'm militant. I'm militant. You can fight the devil with two ways. Holy water or fire. I chose the fire. That was his reply. And when I started my dawa, I used his material, but I was very soft. Very soft, very kind. No results. In the medical college, I started dawa. Then I became militant. More militant than Sheikh Didad. And voila, what results I got. My Muslim friends used to run away. I was left alone with the non-Muslims. The results I got after being militant, then mashallah, Allah gave me daya. Coming more on the stage, I became soft. I became so soft that when the questioners abused me, I used to smile. So Sheikh Didat. Then he gave me the title. First he gave me Didat Plus. Then when he saw me, son, they're abusing you. They're cursing you. And you're smiling. Then he gave me the title that son, what took me 40 years to achieve, you have achieved it in four years. And Alhamdulillah. You know, if you know my history, my background, I was a person who always wanted something best. I could never compromise for number two. Best. In childhood days, I remember, best electronics. Now, I've converted my desire to have best things in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to have the best of camera, best of equipment, state-of-the-art equipment, only to spread the message of Allah. I want to have the best conference. And that's why we have this conference. It was my desire. After seeing Grammy Awards and Oscar Awards, objective is haram, but I have to admire their science and technology. So we said, why can't we do the same for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The purpose is different. The purpose is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To show to the world that we Muslims also, alhamdulillah, all these things, not that without this we can't do dawah, but we want to show that even we want the best for the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we want the best office for ourselves, you know, we want best office in a house, Italian marble, I put Italian marble in my office in Islamic Research Foundation. There's no Italian marble in my house. Why? The place where people come to learn about Allah, I want to give them the best. At that time, when in the 1990s, Italian marble in India, Muslim office, unheard of. We started small. We only 20 to 25 square meters was my office. 25 square meters of office. One employee. Now, mashallah, Allah's grace. We have more than 400 employees, mashallah. The largest dawah organization, mashallah. Allah's help. And in school days, I was very good in debating. Very good. What was the purpose? Just to win the debate. Now I change my purpose. Trying to spread the deen. Deen al haq Got more results. First, I used to sleep only five hours, six hours, medical college. Now, sleep only three hours for sake of Allah. And I always had the philosophy of doing something unique or best in the world, one of the two. MashaAllah started a unique channel, Peace TV, on comparative religion. Allah made it the most popular channel in the world. More than 100 million viewers, MashaAllah. After a couple of years, we launched a new channel. Peace TV Urdu, last conference, we announced, inshallah, in June or July, we will launch a new channel, Peace TV Urdu, and Allah made it possible. This year, on 19th of June, we launched a new channel, Peace TV Urdu. Inshallah, in this conference, the last day of the conference, inshallah, inshallah, if Allah wills, I would like to announce, we'll be launching a third channel, Peace TV Bangla. Because Bangla language, 
Mashallah, a few hundred million people speak Bangla language. It's a requirement. My desire is to have Islamic channel in all the languages. But as for inshallah, after Ramadan, inshallah, next year, 2010, inshallah, if Allah wills, if Allah helps, with Allah's help, we will launch the third channel, Peace TV Bangla, inshallah. It was a desire that besides channel, have a place where people are trained for the purpose of life. And we started our school, Islamic International School. Purpose is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But while pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you realize Allah, inshallah, will give you in the year after and even in this world. With the same desire. I started the school saying, inshallah, every student of the school, an in Islamic international school, we have more than 400 in Bombay and about 250 in Chennai. Inshallah, all of them, inshallah, all of them will get 100 times better teaching and surrounding than what Zakir Naik got. It is up to Allah whether he creates Zakir Naik's a multiple, but our desire is give them a base, give them a foundation where they can have 100 times better training, foundation, atmosphere than what Zakir Naik had. But it is in the hands of Allah whether he makes or not. And just to give you one more example of my son, Farik Naik. You know my son, mashallah, as I told you in my speech day for yesterday, I don't know Arabic as a language. I said I will teach my son Arabic, inshallah. And all the students of our school we taught, mashallah. My son, when the school started, mashallah, he got the best sports boy trophy. Not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, for five consecutive years. It made me happy. It made me happy. You know, because we used to think, you know, when I was in school, when I was in school, I used to admire. Coming out first, getting gold medal, that was my goal, you know. Young Stodo, coming out first in 100 meter dash. In school, I never got any medal. When I reached college, mashallah, I discovered that I was a long distance runner. And I got a gold medal in the medical college in 10 kilometers. But then I realized, gold medal, useless. Good. From far it looks good. What is the gold medal? 10 kilometers, people are pretty, nothing great. Then I was inspired by Sheikh Ahmad Didad. Ah, this is the man. And my focus changed. And that's how, mashallah, he told me that, son, I have done research and study in Christianity and Islam, you study other religions. Christianity is like everything on a platter. Sheikh Dida did the job so well, everything on a platter. It's a cakewalk. If you read Sheikh Dida's book, you can even debate the Pope. So then I studied Hinduism, Sikhism, Jainism, science, other subjects, and mashallah. As to admire the crowd that Sheikh Dida, the largest audience he addressed in Birmingham, 12,000 people. Mashallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. MashaAllah. He opened up the pathways with his help. MashaAllah, my son. Then became Hafizul Quran at the age of 13. Unique style. One year, five days a week. Unique. People said Zakir is crazy. One hour every day, five days a week, nine months a year. Impossible. Most of the students in our school, within two and a half to four years, they completed his. And one amongst them was my son. Then my son got black belt in Taekwondo. But what really pleased me was when he started giving lectures in public. At the age of eight, small lectures, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 50,000 people, 100,000 people before my talks. The first time I gave a lecture, public lecture, was at the age of 27, 28. People used to tell me, oh, what a young person, 28 years used to feel. 28 years old. 
Shay Dida, 60, 70, 28 years, we used to feel happy. My son, the first long public lecture of more than 1 hour 15 minutes with 119 quotations, 56 from the Quran, 52 from the Bible, and 11 ahadith with Arabic at the age of only 14. Half my age. That pleased me. MashaAllah, 1 hour 15 minutes, 119 quotations without any notes. And this year, mashallah, again he gave a lecture. Just last week, last Sunday he gave a lecture. This Sunday again he gave a lecture. First misconception of Islam, concept of God. Inshallah, inshallah, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he accept his efforts. And always tell, I tell my son, that Allah has given you the means. But see to it that make your requirements small. Make your requirement less. Why? Tomorrow you may not have this luxury. Your aim is to do da'wah. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fusila, chapter 41, verse number 33. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ كَوَلَمْ مِمَّنْ دَعِ اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحَوْ وَقَوَلَ إِنَّنِ مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness and says that I'm a Muslim. Why I say? I remember when I married my wife, I told her, I'm a doctor. I can promise you only 4,000 rupees a month. 4,000 rupees is less than $100. I can only promise you 4,000 rupees a month. If you want to marry me, marry me. And mashallah, she was a teacher in the college, earning much more than what I promised her. But she also wanted to die. Mashallah. So I tell my son, make your requirements less, so that if you are used to sleeping on the floor, if you are used to taking all the troubles, if you have to sacrifice and yet continue your dawah, it's easy. If you are used to luxury, and if the luxury is taken away from you, it will prevent you from continuing as a dai. MashaAllah. I've seen to it that my son has slept on the floor. He has been in seven-star hotels. Train the person when he's young. He should be able to take the struggle of life. Don't give him a silver spoon in the mouth, which will be difficult for him to achieve the purpose of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I would like to end my talk by just summarizing. In order to achieve the purpose of your life, in different stages of your life, you have to see that you are towards the direction. Before I give these six points, when people take admission in our school, I normally ask them, when is the best time, the latest time, that you have to think about the future of your child? When is latest? What your child will become? What will he do? When is latest? Many people reply, when he goes to college. Some people say that no, when he takes admission in school. Some people say, no, when he takes admission in kindergarten. No one has given me answer earlier than that. The Islamic way, the latest that you can think about the future of your child is when you choose your life partner. When you choose your life partner is the time you think, what will you make your son? Because the mother, the father, the parents, they are the best teachers. You have to plan early. That's the latest that you have to think regarding the future of your child. I'd like to summarize the purpose of life and how a person should lead is number one, that when you get education, see to it you get education in an institution, in a school, in a college, which caters to you for both the worlds, for Akhira and this world. Only the degrees of this world will not help you. Put him in a school which caters for both Akhira and this world both. And inshallah, we started with that philosophy of having Islamic International School. And if Allah wills, we want to expand more branches of such schools. Number two, they should see to it that they have friends 
which also have the same purpose of life. They are friends which are Islamic. When they grow up, they should join organization whose goal and objective is based on Quran and Sai Hadith. Join Islamic organization. But before joining organization, check whether that organization is following the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given in the Quran and the things of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Number four. When they choose their profession. Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number three, verse number 104. That let there arise out of you a band of people that enjoin people towards the good and forbid them from doing wrong. These are the ones that shall attain felicity. Allah says in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33. Woman Hasanu Kala Mimman Doyla Lahi, Wamil Solihon, Wakala in the Limna Muslimin. Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness, and says that I'm a Muslim? Choose a profession that will take him closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's no better profession than the profession of spending your time in spreading the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number five. See to it that you choose your life partner which has the same purpose, same goal. Allah and His Rasul. Allah centered. And the sixth point, I would like to end my talk by the verse of the Quran from Surah Anam, chapter number six, verse number 162, which says, Inna salati wa nusuki wa ma yahya wa ma mati billahi rabbil alameen. All my prayers, my service of sacrifice, my life and my death are for the sake of Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Wa akhru dawana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.